because i'll just share the link okay sure sure all right um uh, it's 10 o'clock we will get started with our class uh, so uh, last class we saw that um yeah we kind of finished off with repentance we started on the topic of the overcoming life uh, which is the final section in your notes uh, so um, we had the initial introduction to um, holiness we looked at god and his holiness we looked at why we need to be holy why that is important for us uh, to do so we looked at all of those aspects and then we moved into the practical aspect one very basic fundamental uh, um, uh, foundation of holiness which is repentance and we kind of spent uh, quite some time looking at that uh, how uh, repentance looks in um, real everyday life so we have looked at that and then having considered uh, the whole topic of repentance last class we sort of moved into this final section uh, which talks about how we can have an overcoming life. Uh, now, today, our main focus will be on um, the basis for this overcoming life. Why do we go around saying always that Christians can live victoriously, that they don't have to be subject to sin? Uh, what is it that uh, you know gives us the confidence to say that? Or are we just you know, indulging in wishful thinking? Uh, really, can a, can, a, can a believer live in victory over sin? Uh, the, we all have our own areas of weakness. Um, there are some areas in which we are strong, in which we are almost immune. I mean, if somebody came to me with a packet of drugs and said, you know, use it, use it, I wouldn't even be interested. I mean, it, it just wouldn't even interest me. That is my area of strength. Oh, but then there are other areas of weakness. Uh, you see uh, where i can be tempted where i can fall so um we all have our areas of strength but then there are areas where uh, we, we we can get very easily ensnared uh, you see uh, so is it really possible for a believer to live in victory in those areas you know in those areas where we have fallen so often that now that's almost like a stronghold um it's, it's it's like we are we are a prisoner inside that you know the term stronghold um we've kind of even forgotten what the actual meaning of that word is uh, but then in the you know originally the word stronghold basically means a fortress you know it's the strong fortress and uh, so that's used positively in the sense of god is my my stronghold in the sense you know i can hide myself in him he will fight on my behalf we also use the term stronghold uh, in in a in a negative sense, as in you know, it's a, it's this it's this very strong fortress inside which you are trapped as a slave, as a prisoner, and you're just not able to come out on your own. It's um um it, it, it there's just no way of escape from that stronghold. You know, uh, it's the kind of uh, picture that we have in this negative sense. You know, when we use this word, uh, so um, some areas of uh, sin, of temptation and weakness have become such strongholds we don't even know how to come of it uh, come come out of it how to escape so is it really um uh, wishful thinking that a believer can actually live in victory in every area of their lives uh, can can a person actually have victory even in these areas where uh, you know which have kind of become strongholds over the years uh, so uh, to even start talking about this topic, we need to lay the foundation and show very clearly that scripture uh, tells us, declares to us that yes, we can have an overcoming victorious life, not just in the areas of our strength, but even in the areas of weakness. By the power of the Holy Spirit, it is possible for us to come out of even those areas that are holding us down. It is a, it is it is something that we need to absorb and accept as reality. So at the very level of our thinking, our mind needs to be renewed regarding these um, scriptural truths. So uh, today's class is mainly about that way we are laying a scriptural foundation and showing very clearly that it is very much possible 
you know, for believers um, uh, to live uh, victoriously in every area, even in areas where they feel uh, that they are weak. Uh, uh, and uh, why do we say that? Uh, what is the foundational, you know, basis, uh, you know, from scripture, which, you know, uh, affirms this? And um, we've, in fact, been going looking at Romans 6, uh, Romans 6, 6 for a very long time, you know, and we keep repeating that in the, in, in the class uh, almost every session because uh, that kind of brings out the, the, the key idea, you know, that that lies to the very core of this whole overcoming victorious life. I mean, if we, we were still that same person that we were before salvation, if we still had that helpless, enslaved, weak, defeated, old, you know, spiritually dead spirit, if, if we still had that uh, and, and that was our identity, then really there is not much change, you know. Uh, but Romans 6, 6 has explained to us, has established that on that day when we are in that moment of salvation, that... Uh, that spiritually dead spirit inside us was crucified along with Christ. So, you uh, know, we we know that that's one truth that you know we have kind of um, uh, reflected upon in all of all of our previous sessions. So, um, the one main reason why we even say that an overcoming victorious life is possible is because we are no longer that person who was you know enslaved in sin. Now we are free people. We are a new creation created uh, by the Holy Spirit, given birth to by the Holy Spirit. And now we are we have the freedom to choose. So it's not that we are slaves anymore the way we were earlier. It's just that uh, many believers don't quite understand this truth. And they think that they are still as helpless as they were earlier before uh, the salvation experience. And so they continue to live in that defeated way because it has not gotten through to them. And that is why it says in Romans 6, reckon yourself, you know, uh, see yourself as being dead. Others, this is not going to work at the very thinking level, at the very level of our worldview, our perception, our perspective, at that very basic level, we need to absorb this fact and accept it as a fact which is what you know it, it talks about in Romans 6 when it says reckon yourself as being dead uh, to sin so uh, we, we got to count this as a uh, as a fact we all accept that gravity is a reality when we drop something it falls in the same way this is a fact we got to accept that on that uh, day you know in that moment of salvation when we when we turned over our life to Jesus Christ and in that moment we were, crucified we were uh, that that sinful uh, spiritually dead spirit was killed crucified done away with and god placed a new uh, creation in us and made us that that became our new identity where we were reborn into a brand new person with a clean slate with no um, with no entanglements there are no uh, there are no bonds you know binding us we are now free people. The, the bonds that we still feel is because of the unrenewed mind. The mind in that moment of salvation was not automatically transformed into a new creation. So because the mind still contains all the old habits, the old thought patterns, uh, the old perspective of life, now that has to be renewed on a day-to-day -day basis. So mainly we stay in bondage because we don't renew our mind and grow in the truths of God's word and stand on that word and you know um, uh, make that our testimony because the people in Revelation about whom it testifies and says that they, are, they, they were victorious, they were victorious because you know um, they uh, stood on the blood of Jesus. You know they they, pro they proclaimed the blood of Jesus in the sense they proclaimed the finished work of the cross. What what Jesus Christ had done for them on the cross. They proclaimed that, and that was their testimony. So they so they stood on the on the testimony of what uh, the cross had done for them and how they have they had applied that to their own lives in living in victory and that's basically how they overcame they overcame by the blood the finished work of the cross and they overcame by the word of their testimony they declared that this is who i am now and therefore this is how i shall live as a victorious person who is who is now a new creation i will no longer look upon myself as that person who got crucified that day 
you know at the moment of salvation so this is one very very fundamental truth um but you know there are other verses before and after romans chapter 6 6 uh, and we uh, kind of you know need to touch upon those things just to get a um, clearer picture of our status uh, who we are and it is because of who we are and once we understand this once we absorb this the reality of what is being told over here and we 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 humbly accept it as the truth because what god says is true he never lies he never deceives when he says something is something then we got to accept that as a fact and uh, so um, we will not dwell so much on roman 66 6, which we have kind of you know already grasped and understood but we will look at some verses before and after that and uh, you know look at the implications of what you know of that of of what that holds for us you know in our uh, uh, everyday christian walk so if we could have someone maybe uh, read out um you know in a room from roman 6 and you know rather than just simply reading roman 6 6 which is what we generally do if we could start off maybe with uh, verse 4 itself you know romans chapter 6 verse 4 which is how you know paul in fact introduces the whole topic so romans chapter 6 verse 4 and then we will go on up to verse 7 and then uh, look at some other aspects uh, so romans chapter 6 if we could have someone read out for all the way from verse 4 up to verse 7 please romans chapter 6 okay romans chapter 6 okay, uh, yeah. verses 4 to 7 therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father even so we also should walk in newness of life for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection knowing this that our old man was crucified with was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves of sin for he who has died has been freed from sin yes so um uh, we have understood verse 6 uh, that um, you know the old sinful spirit which was inside this human container that was crucified finished off and instead a new creation was placed inside this human container that we are living in and that new creation is who we are now we are literally children of god birthed by the holy spirit um now in this last so which is why it says you see we were buried with him and then uh, we were raised with him and one day you know we are um, we will also be glorified you know when we receive our uh, resurrected bodies so all of this in all of this we are identifying with christ uh, because now we have become one with him you know uh, Salv- the salvation experience made us one with him and so in him we experience these things um then it says here in this last portion you know verse 7 because anyone who has died has been set free from sin okay here it's talking about legal status and uh, this kind of gets you know explained in other places uh, romans chapter 6 verse 14 almost says the same thing if someone could read out for us romans chapter 6 verse 14 romans chapter 6 verse 14 for sin shall not be your master because you are not under law but under grace ah uh, yes we oh, are yeah, just before it you know escapes my mind you know someone could really have kindness on me mercy on me and remind me to switch on the recording for the second session uh because last time i did not do that it did not get recorded and i had to do it all over again to post on the platform you know um so this happens to me okay i'm rather absent minded so in the other classes the students are so merciful they kind of remind me if i have not switched on the recording they say you know please do that and then that saves me a lot of extra effort so you know even here you know you second year guys if you can please uh you know if you ever notice that this recording is not on if you could please remind me to switch it on you know it kind of saves me doing the uh, doing a double job uh yeah 
that's you know that's just um, that just popped into my head um yeah uh, so uh, we were looking at romans chapter 6 verse 14 where it says almost the same thing that we saw in verse 7 um it says sin shall no longer be your master why because you are not under the law but under grace and the same thing in verse 7 it said anyone who has died has been set free from sin now both of these verses are uh, talking about our uh, legal status um yeah so uh, let us understand uh, what is being talked about over here or uh, what is this whole thing about our legal status and about the law and about us now being not under the law but under grace what is this all about uh, for us to get a background we would maybe need to go to romans chapter 2 verses 9 to 16 which i know is kind of a lengthy passage but it's got a lot of stuff in there which talks about um the basic human race and uh, what their legal status was when they first you know came into the world and they were born into this world and it's very very important for us to understand that first so romans chapter 2 verses 9 to 16 you know if you could just turn in your bibles to that um um well okay um it, it starts off in verse 9 by saying uh, there will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil first for the jew then for the gentile um you know so there will be trouble there will be distress for every human who does evil whether you're a jew or whether you're a gentile if you sin yes you will have trouble you will have distress and verse 11 explains for god does not show favoritism you know just because you're a jew you're not going to be excused if you live in sin in the same way the gentiles are being punished and judged you too will be punished and judged and then it says in verse 12 um maybe we could if someone could read out verses 12 to 16. how does the law you see apply to jews and how does the law apply to gentiles uh, both of them are going to have trouble both of them are going to have distress for breaking the law but what law are they breaking you know let's uh, someone could read out romans 2 12 to 16. romans 2 12 to 16 for as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law for not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of god but the doers of the law will be justified for when gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law these although not having the law are a law to themselves who show the work of the law written in their hearts their conscience also hearing witness and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them in the day when god will judge the secrets of men by jesus christ according to my gospel Amen. so so you see uh, some people are born as jews into the jewish community and from the moment of birth they are expected to fulfill they were expected to fulfill the mosaic law uh, on the other hand you had a whole bunch of human beings who were born being born outside the jewish community and this does not mean that they were free from the law of god because even though they didn't you know god did not uh, come down upon sinai and give a, give a, you know his laws to them it is something that is programmed into them every human is instinctively knows that there are some moral absolutes which they should not break no one has to go and sit next to them and tell them you know what murder is something wrong it's not something that you should do everyone knows that instinctively inside us we know that uh, that murder is wrong it is sinful in the same way even something as basic as lying why do people try to cover up their lies it's because they know that what they are doing is not correct and it's something which is uh, that if they are caught telling a lie it's a humiliating thing because everyone knows that what you have done is doesn't have integrity and your lack of integrity is exposed and it is shameful so you see nobody teaches us these things we instinctively know that certain things are wrong why because the law of god is written on people's hearts everyone knows you know um, at least to some extent you know they all are aware that certain things are sinful they are wrong 
and some things are good. So depending on the way people are conducting themselves, irrespective of whether they are Jews or whether they're Gentiles, you know, in certain things, their heart, um, you know, uh, defends them and they know that what they are doing is right, is good. But in some things, they can feel the conviction. They are they realize in their heart that what they are doing is not good, and they try to you know uh, cover it up. Uh, so instinctively, people know right and wrong, and that is why it says in verse sixteen, one day God will judge. You know the secrets, the the things which they have tried to hide. It will all come out, and God will say, yes, in these things they what they did was right. In these things, what they did uh, it was wrong. So in that sense. Every person who is born into the world automatically comes under the law. They either come under the Mosaic law or they come under the general law which is written on human hearts. And because of the sinful nature which is there in us humans, we start breaking that moral code at a very, very early age. So once we break the law, sin which is like waiting over there, you know, on the sidelines, it says, Ha, this person has sinned. Now I have the uh, legal right to control this person and enslave them. Why? Because now they have broken the law and that gives me the legal right to move in and take hold of them and make them my prisoners. So in that way, all of humanity becomes a slave to sin because once the law is broken, sin has the legal right to enslave us and keep us under its control and in fact force us to break the law more and more and more so that we are firmly totally under its control helpless to ever set ourselves free that is the condition of humanity um, but then here it says you know in in our romans chapter 6 verse 7 anyone who has died has been set free from sin um, and the same thing is said even in Romans six fourteen: for sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. What it's saying over here is that in on that day, in that moment of salvation, when the, when, when the old spiritually dead thing that was inside, you know, your spirit, I mean, you, that, that was literally you because you're a spirit being. Um, so you, the spiritually dead spirit being, uh, you were crucified with Christ and once you died law had no longer any control over you because you're dead uh, law can only have control over living people you know we understand that in the natural so easily right um, a garment can't go to a dead person and you know uh, poke him in the ribs and say hey get up you know you need to pay your taxes once that person is dead they are dead the law has no hold over them. It can't make them do anything. They are beyond the law. They are dead. So that is what happened to us. We are we were the, the on that day when we were crucified with Jesus Christ, we died to the law. The law is no longer our master. It has no control over us. But now we came under a new master, Jesus Christ. So we don't do all these, you know, things that we do and avoid doing the wrong things that we avoid. We don't do all of that because we are under the law. We are doing it because we are under now our new master, Jesus Christ. And he just tells us what to do, what not to do, you know, uh, through the leading of the Holy Spirit. And we stay obedient to him. So we are no longer under our old master, the uh, sin, uh, you know, which, 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 began to control us because we broke the law so we are no longer under the law nor are we under the sin which you know became our slave master we are under a new master jesus christ who says to us in matthew 11 you take my yoke upon you and you know you learn from me you'll discover that my yoke is very light i'm not like the law i'm not like um, uh, you know sin the slave master I, on the other hand, am, am a gentle and humble master, is what Jesus says about himself. Uh, so um, we are uh, now, uh, like it says in Romans 6.14, um, sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. So um, this is one uh, you know, basic fundamental truth that uh, we need to grasp. And now let's elaborate a little more on it. Um, Romans chapter 8, 
verses 3 and 4. If someone could read out Romans 8, 3 and 4. Romans 8, verses 3 and 4. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit yes Amen. so the law is a good thing see the law was god given god gave the law and the law in fact um, you know uh, it it reflects his character his righteousness his holiness so the law is in fact a good thing and so the law started telling people, you know, you've got to live this way. you got to, you know, uh, behave in this particular manner. You must avoid doing these things. The law said all of those things, but the law was powerless in, in making people do it. Why? Because people are enslaved under sin. Sin has become their master, their slave master, and sin is controlling them. So even though the law is very good and it's telling them how to live and how to honor God and you know have communion with Him, the law is not able to help them to be that. Uh, the law is only able to tell them that they are wrong, that they are sinning, that they're under judgment. It's not able to uh, empower them to be good because they are enslaved under sin you know, uh, which has become their slave master. And uh, so the entire human race is in the grip of this slave master sin. What hope is there for them? How can they ever come out of the grip of this sinful one and have a relationship with God and have eternal life rather than, you know, being condemned to death and judgment and eternal hell? So what is the hope? So gee, this is what God does for humanity. It says over here, the law was powerless to, to, to uh, um, yeah, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. So the solution that God uh, came up with is that he's going to send Jesus Christ in the likeness of sinful flesh. You know, the, the same way we are, we are all, uh, you know, people who are, um, you know, living over here on this earth, helpless, uh, you know, uh, not able to come out of the grip of sin. Now, in the same way, Jesus is also going to become 100% human, just like us. He's not going to use any of his divine powers while he is on this earth. He's going to be as you uh, know, weak and helpless as us. And, you know, in his humanity, he now has to choose. Is he going to keep the law or is he going to break the law? He's not going to have any special supernatural powers and abilities. Okay, what we have, he's also going to be having the same set of, you know, uh, capabilities. Um, Adam, whatever Adam originally had, the abilities that he had as a human, that's, that is all that Jesus Christ would be given. He would not be given some supernatural power to resist sin. He would just be the way Adam was. The problem with Adam, our first representative, is what did he do? He gave in to sin. And when he gave in to sin, he dragged us all into you know, uh, sin along with him. In the sense, he passed his sinful nature to us. So our first representative, Adam, really failed us. But now here a new representative is being sent. And this new representative is just like Adam was 100% human. Jesus Christ is all, has also come 100% human. He is not using his div divinity in any way. So he is literally our true representative. In the same way, Adam was also a true representative. And now the second representative, what does he do? And what does he do? Even though he is like us, he doesn't have any special powers, he chooses to keep the law. He keeps it and the entire law. He doesn't break it even once. Uh, 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 he doesn't break even one of the laws even once. So um, by doing that, he condemns sin in the flesh. You know, that's basically what it means over here. He condemned sin in the flesh in the sense he declared, I am a human being. 
I'm 100% human, but I have not broken the law even once. So sin, you have no control over me. You have absolutely no control over me. So he became this perfect human who, even though he was 100% human, just like us, he chose not to sin. OK, so um, um, he could he never came under the control of the slave master sin. And so now anyone who comes to him and they place themselves under him, Jesus says, in the same way, sin has no control over me. Now, these people who have come to me uh, to be under my wing, under my atoning work, you know, now the same, uh, you know, freedom, I pass it on to them. In the same way, sin, you have no control over me. Sin, you will no longer have any control over my people who have now come under the atoning work of the cross, which I did on their behalf. On the cross, I paid the price for all the sins that they have done. So now they, you have no legal right over them. And I, their representative, who is sinless, was you know, legally in a position to actually make the sacrifice on their behalf because I never came under the control of sin. So I, the sinless representative, was able to be the sacrifice for all the sinful things which they did. I paid the price in full for everything that they, you know, ha they have done and everything that they in will, in fact, even do in the future. All that is now covered by my by by my atoning work. You know, in 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 NKJV that would that would be called the propitiation for our sins. Uh, in in NIV, it's just basically the atoning work of Christ on the cross. So this is what Jesus Christ has done for us. So the second representative, he um, he he invites people to come and place themselves under his grace. So by his free grace, we are now uh, you know. Um, come under his righteousness because he paid the price for us. And in the same way, uh, sin has no control over him. You know, He has condemned sin in the flesh. In the same way, sin has no control over him. It can now have no control over us either. So we are as free as Jesus is from sin. You know, uh, So that actually is our legal status now. Um, and um, uh, so in Romans chapter 6, you know, going back to those very, very familiar verses, when it says uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, um, it talks about how, um, OK, if someone could just simply read out only, OK, it's all right. Go ahead and read out both the verses. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. And you know, even as you're reading it, kind of think about what we have talked about. What is our new status in Jesus Christ? How did we get that new status? Now, in that, you know, keeping that in mind, look at what Jesus Christ did as our representative. We all know what Adam did as our representative. He dragged us into sin. But what is this new representative, Jesus Christ? What did he do for us? Romans 6, 3 to 4, if someone can read. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 to 4. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So, um, you know, this is our union with Christ. Uh, that has taken place at the moment of salvation. And the example that someone used for this is of a bucket of water and a sponge. OK, so the bucket of water is Jesus Christ in this example. And uh, the believer is the sponge. The, you know, uh, the sponge is immersed in the bucket of water. And uh, so the, the, the sponge begins to absorb the water. It starts to, uh, uh, you know, become a part of the water in that sense. Of course, the water remains water and the sponge remains a sponge. It's not the sponge doesn't become water. We believers don't become divine. We are united with Christ. Um, uh, but and, and we absorb him because we are abiding in him. He flows, you know, into us, uh, his power, his enabling. Or his righteousness, all of that is constantly, you know, uh, being given to us on a regular basis. So we are, we we are like the sponge which is absorbing him and becoming like him. Uh, but of course, we never become divine. 
uh, so uh, having understood that you know not carrying not dragging out the example too far understanding the limitations of the example the point is wherever the bucket goes the sponge also goes everything that the bucket experiences is now the experience of the sponge which is inside inside the bucket which is inside christ so this is what happens for the believer so when jesus christ now you know was crucified the sponge which was inside jesus christ this believer who has now placed himself in christ he also is crucified when jesus comes out of that baptism uh, baptism waters of death you know he rises up we believers also in him the sponge which is in him that also rises up the experience of the bucket uh, is now you know every experience of the bucket has gone through it's now a reality even for the sponge so in the same way after jesus um you know uh, jesus rose up and then uh, he went on to be glorified in the sense he received his resurrection body so one day we too will receive a resurrection body just like him and so uh, when it comes to overcoming sin the experience of the bucket will be the experience of the sponge the sponge understands its new status and lives in that way jesus lived in victory complete victory over sin throughout his life and in him we too can have the very same experience because we are united with christ you see so uh, that actually is our legal status so we need to fundamentally understand this of course there are practical things that we would uh, um uh, uh yeah jeffina that's really not my example at all it's something that this wonderful man of god came up with which you know which i read in a website and i was like very excited when i read that example i was like wow i had never thought about the union there are beautiful articles out there you know which which these people of god just make available freely for us i mean we just need to have the time to be able to read all of that but uh, it's amazing they don't charge anything it's just free and they just give us those resources just like that you know may god bless them for you know the work that they are doing uh, so um yeah getting back to this um yeah what was i saying um yeah so so this is our legal status and uh, we need to fundamentally first understand this now once we have understood this then we can start you know using the practical uh, tips which are available in the bible uh, to live a victorious life but if we have not even understood these basic facts then always you know satan brings this thought into our mind that no jesus is jesus because he was divine he was god he overcame sin what makes you think that someone like you will ever you know live in victory so that so satan will keep speaking lies into our heads so we need to first of all grasp these things and renew our mind in these fundamental truths once we catch it once our mind really begins to understand this then we will have greater confidence in you know imitating jesus christ and by his power living victoriously so that was one one main fundamental truth that we needed to, needed to understand and the second very very important fundamental truth is that we need to understand that satan has been defeated he is powerless and when we when we hear that statement about satan being powerless it sounds ridiculous to our human ears because we we know that he is still very very powerful so why on earth does you uh, know that the scripture say that so this is another very important fundamental truth that we need to grasp that we need to understand so if we could have someone read out hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 hebrews 2:14 Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 Since the children have flesh and blood he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death that is the devil Okay so the it says over there you know in the in the version that she read out that he has been destroyed his power has been destroyed in 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 NIV it says uh so that by his death you know by the death of jesus um he might break the power of him who holds the power of death that is the devil so the devil's power has been broken uh satan is powerless 
Now, what do we mean by this? Because you see, um, uh, the thing about the Lord is that when He gives, uh, when He gives His created beings His giftings, He never withdraws those giftings. Uh, when a person is living in sin, they still continue to be uh, able to, you know, move in those giftings. For instance, a teacher. If a teacher is living in sin, they would still have the ability to teach. They would still have the ability to preach. Uh, God never withdraws his gifting. In the same way, when the angels were originally created and they were given certain giftings, even after they fall, even after they fell, even after they became uh, fallen angels and turned into demons, uh, they continued to hold on to their giftings. So Satan can maybe you know lift a chair off the ground and make it float in the air. So you see, Satan has got his powers still. Uh, he's got uh, you know the the he's got brains. He's able to come up with uh, schemes and strategies to uh, you know um, attack uh, the people of God uh, and, and to maybe you know to 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 draw them into temptation. So in that sense, Satan still has his powers, but his power over us is broken. It please you know let's let's grasp this. Satan. He has his giftings, you know, whatever he was originally given when he was still under the Lord and still, you know, honoring the Lord, whatever was given to him, he still has those powers, but he has no power over us. So for us today, I, the believer who am in Christ, I'm united with Christ. To me, it really doesn't matter how much power that Satan has. It's irrelevant for me because his, he has no power over me. Uh, he may be powerful in a, you know, in, in, a, in a physical sense, but that power cannot even touch me as long as I am under Christ. His power over me, over believers, is broken. He has no power over me unless I am foolish enough to go and place myself back under him, which is why it says in scripture again and again, do not give your uh, your body as instruments of unrighteousness. You have you have been set free to be under Christ. Christ is your new new master. You give your you know your the members of your body as instruments of righteousness to Him. Don't go and give it to Satan once again. You, you're no no longer under Him. You have no He has no power over you. You know, um, in uh, in in uh, U.S. law, uh, there's this thing about a restraining order. You know, uh, if you watched enough detective serials, you'd kind of be familiar with the idea. Um, so uh, basically, let us say a gangster is, you know, uh, harassing somebody, uh, you know, for money or whatever. And so this person goes to the police and the police, uh, you know, they um, they issue an, a restraining order or rather the court issues a restraining order um, where, you know, this person uh, is not, the gangster cannot go within some number of feet uh, of that person, you know, they cannot go near that person, uh, attack him, you know, uh, abuse him. So there's a restraining order placed against the gangster, and he, if he's caught within the that number of feet of that person's house, or you know, uh, then you know, the he can he can be thrown in jail. So it's like a uh, so the gangster no longer has any power over this man because this man is now protected by the law. But if this man foolishly walks up to the gangster and say, hey, punch me, you know, he gets punched. It's, it would be a highly foolish and dumb thing to do, uh, which is what sometimes we believers do. So the power of Satan over us is broken, established fact. OK, this is something that Jesus Christ did on the cross. Um, it, you know, if Hebrews 2.14, it brings it out so beautifully. Since the children have flesh and blood, you know, we're just helpless human beings made of flesh and blood he too shared in their humanity he became 100 percent human like us why did he do that so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death he god jesus christ went to that extent to break the power of satan over us satan has a restraining order he cannot come and harm us he there are serious divine eternal restrictions placed on him now he is one defeated foe but he can stand over there at a distance and tempt us he can meddle with our thinking and you know and make us believe in his lies and he'll draw us 
he will tempt us to come 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 near me i cannot come to you but you can come to me come come you know be tempted don't trust this lord of lords you know so he does that so the power of satan over us is broken established fact it uh, and it's only when we go to him when we e expose ourselves to danger only then does he have the authority to meddle in our lives so this is another very fundamental truth that we need to understand that satan is a defeated foe um for such an ancient word is is a defeated enemy um, yeah satan is a defeated enemy and he has no power over us and the third important fact um is that um we have been redeemed now you know we are so familiar with that term we kind of even have stopped thinking about what it actually means uh, but um, this uh, again you know a lot of spiritual significance in that um, so let's look at how we are redeemed and what that could mean for us uh, so colossians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14 if someone could read out please colossians 1 13 and 14. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 and 14. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. All right. So uh, we were slaves of sin. We were under the control of our slave master, sin. But now our sins have been forgiven. And because all our sins now stand forgiven, you know, we have been declared righteous in God's eyes. So sin can no longer control us. We have been set free. So we have we are now brought from Satan's kingdom where people are under the slavery of sin. We have been brought out from there as free people. And now we have been placed in this other kingdom, the kingdom of the sun. So as long as our sins were not forgiven, we were still there in that kingdom of darkness under the control and dominion of um, of sin uh, under the slavery of you know satan but once our sins were forgiven once the righteousness of jesus christ you know covered us once that became our legal status the dominion of darkness no longer has any control over us so we were brought from that dark kingdom into the into the kingdom of the sun uh, you know and so we now have a, a new citizenship and um, um, uh, okay, fine. Maybe we can just go maybe two minutes over time, and you know, uh, get into the break. Um, so yeah, so we now we understand our citizenship rights very, you know, in a in a, in a very um, um, clear manner when it comes to the uh, natural realm. You know, because see, if I am a citizen of India, and one day I come home. And I see that my house has been taken over by a bunch of um, some uh, foreign soldiers from some other nation, some nation ABCD. Okay, that's the uh, I don't want to mention any nation. I have nothing against any nation. You know, so these these foreign soldiers have come and and have taken over my house. You think I'm going to keep quiet? I'm going to say, you know, this is my house. You know, kindly leave. And those foreign soldiers, they say to me, no, don't you know the government of um, uh, ABCD has issued a law that uh, people cannot have private property anymore so now your house is ours i'll say i'm not a king i'm not a citizen of abcd so you know your whatever your your government uh, whatever law your government has passed it doesn't apply to me i'm a citizen of india and so i will go to my government and i'll say you know please help me um, you know these people they have no right over my house because i don't even come under the laws of their kingdom Whatever, whatever laws and regulations you know, the uh, kingdom of ABCD has uh, been issuing, it doesn't apply to me because I am a citizen of India. So my government, in fact, will come to my defense and they will have those uh, soldiers thrown out of my house and I'll reclaim my house. My house will be mine once more. Why? Because I am a citizen of this, of this, of this kingdom of India and uh, um, the laws of this other kingdom abcd kingdom don't even apply to me so i have the legal right to go to my government and my government will act on my behalf and they'll have those uh, foreign soldiers thrown out of my house okay so we understand this very clearly in the natural realm 
and that is basically what is being done for us on a day to day basis by the lord jesus so you we see you see when um, the darkness of uh, when, when the when the kingdom of darkness tries to come and control us when it tries to you know tempt us when it tries to bring us into into subjugation to sinful habits um, and and we are under its control we don't have to put up with that kind of behavior you know we are now citizens of a new kingdom so we can use our authority in christ we can go to our you know our lord and master jesus christ and use the authority that he has given us to get these things vacated from our life from our home you know from our family they have no right over us we now belong to a different kingdom and the king the, the kingdom of uh, the of the son his rules apply to us whatever uh, you know uh, the kingdom of darkness is trying to impose upon us that is no right over us any longer so we can actually because we are redeemed people and we have been brought into a new kingdom the old kingdom cannot continue to exercise its control over us and we have the legal right to ask it to leave in the name of jesus so this is again another very important truth to grasp Uh, which can you know help us when it comes to um, uh, you know uh, uh, times of spiritual battle at that time understanding our legal status we can you know claim and say no i now come under the kingdom of the son of god and so um, whatever you're trying to do in my life and in my family's life you have no legal authority and so by the power given to me by my master jesus christ i can command you in the name of jesus to vacate you know so uh, uh, actually this uh, can be of help sometimes you know in our uh, spiritual battles but of course when it comes to uh, temptation it's a plain no we would have to say no i don't need to you know submit to you i'd rather submit to my new master jesus christ so um, but there are some uh, areas of spiritual battle where understanding this aspect of our legal status helps us you know in getting rid of the activities of satan in our lives because those activities are not being done legally he has no right to meddle in our lives you know if we stay under the covering of our new government um under the garment of jesus christ um so yeah so we've got kind of gone two minutes or you know over the uh, into the break uh, if we can all you know please log back in at 11 o'clock um and you know we'll resume with the class so 11 if we can get back um and at that time if someone could please remind me to switch on the recording yeah thank you so much take your break